honoring a history and culture while determined to keep traditions alive for future generations. Every generations, we're gonna change, but we're gonna free flag, we're gonna appreciate, we're gonna celebrate. Reflecting on the hardships and adversities those before us faced. We're trying to tell that story, yeah, and, and not let history repeat itself. We are highlighting the contributions and influence of different cultures in the community. To have community, that's really how I got my start, is like, meeting mentors here in Sacramento. Tonight, Fox 40 celebrates Asian American and Pacific Islander heritage. Now, a special presentation from Fox 40, honoring Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. Welcome to Fox 40 celebration of Asian American and Pacific Islander history and culture. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Sinceri Tonsil. Over the next half hour, we will take you across Northern California, introducing you to people, places and traditions that help make our community special. From food to art to theater, we'll show you why Asian American and Pacific Islander heritage matters. Starting off tonight, we want to introduce you to Hmong Youth and Parents United, an organization working to improve the lives of all while celebrating and preserving the Hmong language and culture. Fox 40's Monica DeAnda shows us how that organization is improving the lives of some of the most vulnerable in their community. One scoop at a time. And with the right tools in hand. This group of Hmong elders are determined. Vegetable, onion, and pepper, There's so many things on. To create a flourishing garden of hope. All Hmong culture, we would like to make a garden. This garden has been a vision of Haipu for such a long time because we wanted to create, again, a, a space for them to practice uh, culture gardening, but also infuse a lot of urban farming as well, because we do live in an urban area, and really teaching them as well that there are other methods that we can adopt as well. ELO is a program manager for the Senior Day program at the Hmong Hope Center. The program began in 2018 and brings together Hmong elders twice a week. To really provide a safe space for the elders to come together, build a social network. Where can we create a space so that they can uh, really talk about what's important to them? A safe space that means so much to people like Tom Lohr. Everybody um, went to school and my kid, they go to work. Just only me stay home. Uh, so I, I was lonely. Here, he feels happy. The center helped me a lot. I come here, I have lots of friends, and we talk together, and they help me, I help them. Together, this group of elders is focused on the task at hand, <laughs> bringing the Garden of Hope to life. This is for fun, but this is also for real, because, you know, this is where you're going to be putting your heart, your sweat, and your work here. And this is where you're going to make food for you to eat and also share this food out for, you know, other community members as well. It feels really happy. I like everybody to get a too happy. A feeling of happiness <laughs> that echoes in the afternoon activities that follow. Sometimes it's about, um, you know, things that they are going through that is very sad or some traumas that they have experienced or just they want just to have fun with one another or and be out of the house, but be in a very safe space and be with people who can talk their language. Activities range from check-in time, where elders have a safe space to share what's on their mind, to crafts, exercise, meditation, field trips, and more. This is Parley. She tells us she joined the Senior Day program because she was feeling depressed and anxious. But after joining this group, things have turned around for her. I am very happy to be a part of this. They help in many ways. I am the happiest here. I'm having a good time here. I am happy now. Happiness that radiates in their latest project. A labor of love rooted in their culture. When we plant a seed, we want to make sure we have the plant that is the strongest, that's thriving. And as every generation of the seeds, it changes. But it also has little remnants of the past. So I think my Hmong culture and my Hmong community is a resemblance to that where, yeah, every generation we're going to change, but we're going to free flag, we're going to appreciate, we're going to celebrate. A celebration of their culture that they hope brings all generations of Hmong together. In Sacramento, covering local news that matters, Monica Deanda, Fox 40 News. 
Monica, thank you. Well, when not serving the residents of District 2, Interim Sacramento City Council Member Sean Tao is the Executive Director of Hmong Youth and Parents United. You can learn more about the organization and all the programs they offer at fox40.com. The sound of teamwork and synchronization all making for a high energy performance while telling a unique story. Fox 40 contributor photojournalist Henry Takai brings us the tradition and history behind the taiko drums. Taiko is a Japanese art form. It's uh, the word itself means drum. The drum itself dates back thousands of years to Chinese culture and then the Japanese adapted it into their own culture. Before it was used primarily as a, a tool for religious ceremonies and then also for communication in war. It wasn't until really probably like the, the 40s and 50s is when taiko was developed as a performance art. I'm third generation Japanese and uh, Growing up, I didn't know what that meant, but uh, essentially that means that my grandparents immigrated from Japan and they moved to America for a better life. As I got older, studied martial arts, I knew that I needed to be connected in some way to the Japanese culture. That's when it became more important for me. And so then when I moved to Las Vegas, the popularity of just Japanese culture, and I know every culture, Hawaiian culture as well, has grown. We've always had a Chinatown, uh, but you know the Filipino population is huge. The youngest member we have is 10. Eli and his family happened to be there, and uh, I think he may have come up and tried, you know, because we let the kids come up and try the drums, and, and uh, he had a knack for it, so he joined our group. Um, what I learned is like some of the dynamics of songs, like, as example, um, Omiyage, that's one of our songs. I feel like it's important to my life. Mostly all the songs that we play are very fun. They are just, they are tiring, but overall they are fun. For now, it's still a bit hard, but a bit easier also since I'm more used to it. I've been playing for at least a year and a half now. And our thanks to Fox 40 contributor Henry Takai for that story. We have much more to come tonight as we honor AAPI Heritage Month. Coming up, we're introducing you to two artists who are integrating their personal experiences into their art. We'll show the details of an annual night market taking place this month celebrating the AAPI community where these artists will be showcasing their work. The fact that we're able to create this experience for them here in Las Vegas is really quite an honor to create that aloha spirit for our Hawaiian friends. It's no secret Las Vegas is the ninth island, a revolving door of Hawaiian tourists and those who made Sin City their home in the past few years. And it's all thanks to the California Hotel and Casino. Walking through the doors, visitors receive a warm welcome from staff and experience Hawaiian touches from the decor to the delicacies. Hotel managers say they've been so successful in creating a home away from home that they've hosted more Hawaiian high school reunions than any other place in Las Vegas and Hawaii. Well, welcome back to our celebration of AAPI heritage. Several nationalities are being honored this month and most don't speak the same language. Throughout millennia, art has been a universal language among humans and a unique partnership is counting on that to speak volumes about beauty and cultural integrity later this month. Painting in my studio practice is very sacred to me. It's a way for me to express myself. I'm also able to just like amplify messages that I really care about on a bigger scale, out in public, out for the community. Painting has honestly been a lifesaver for me, yeah. With each graceful application of acrylic inside her Sacramento studio, Francesca Gomez creates something with perpetuity and purpose, something very different than what she felt coming to this country from the Philippines. My family and I immigrated here when I was just five years old. The loneliness and isolation of not knowing the language and not comfortably fitting into any community plays into the sacred work she fits in when not tackling someone else's vision in a commission piece like this. Is it in that sacred work when you're just doing something for yourself or it's not commissioned that you feel more of 
your history, your personal imprint, your culture comes out. Definitely. And in making know, psychological space for her identity in her creations, partners. she and her partner have made physical space for it as well, opening 1810 Gallery in Sacramento. To have community. That's really how I got my start, is like meeting mentors here in Sacramento. It's a space where artists like Shante Gorman can grow, giving voice to what is plainly visible, but what many refuse to see. So I just wanted to bring um, some kind of like black and Filipino representation to um, Sailor Moon, just so girls like me and my nieces could like look at that and think it's a dope piece that represents them. Me being black and Filipino, I did not know any other black and Filipino people besides my brother until I was in college. And he's lighter than me. So, you know, in Asian culture, there is some colorism. So, you know, experience that a little bit growing up. As both of these artists um, make space mom. for concepts that don't always find a home in Sacramento automatically. There's a lot of gatekeeping here in Sacramento. The state's biggest political stage will become one for painting as Gorman, Gomez and six others bring all of the capital city into their art with a live painting session during this year's version of the night market hosted annually by the Sacramento Asian Pacific Chamber of Commerce, even for a pro like Frankie. But there's definitely a moment where you're like, oh my God, there's a lot of people watching me right now. <laughs> This new feature, all happening in the wake of a moment many found no humor in this year in the local AAPI arts world. Folks saying they still feel bruised by the mural effort organized by Wide Open Walls. The festival didn't feature any AAPI artists, and some asserted one offering in Little Saigon was an inaccurate representation of Vietnamese culture. While some might guess that this month's live painting session at the night market is in response to all of that, it's actually an idea Gomez has been working on the broad strokes of for years. I've been to the night markets before and I definitely feel like um, it was just the, the, the missing puzzle piece was showcasing local artists. Missing. No more. The night market happens at the Capitol on May 31st. Well, we have much more to come tonight as we honor AAPI heritage. After the break, we'll take you to a museum in downtown Stockton that is highlighting the history of Filipino Americans and paying a tribute to an icon to Filipino migrants. And a gifted 11-year-old Asian American boy is taking center stage at the Met in New York City. We'll hear from his mentors about how the young performer is not letting his disability stop him from achieving his dreams. A young pianist is sharing his passion for music. 11-year-old Ha Wen Dang is a blind fifth grader from Flushing, Queens. He recently performed at the Metropolitan Museum of Art with other members of the Philemon M. D'Agostino Greenberg Music School for the Visually Impaired. It was all part of a free concert series inspired by pieces in the Mets collection. While the music school says all their students are gifted, they say they knew there was something special about Hua Wen from the start. He has that, that something special quality in a musician where he really deeply understands the beauty and the emotion of music. That doesn't happen with everyone. When Hua Wen is not performing or practicing, he hosts a podcast called Blind Kids Live, discussing how he navigates the world without being able to see it. As we continue our celebration of Asian American and Pacific Islander heritage, we now want to take you to Stockton, where a unique museum is capturing the history of Filipino Americans, not only in California, but across the entire country. Fox 40's Rowena Shaddix takes us on a tour and introduces us to a once unsung hero who's now being put right in the spotlight. Talk about the history of the Filipinos. As you pass the walls of the Filipino American National Historical Society Museum in downtown Stockton, they tell of a rich and diverse history of the Filipinos, the hardships they faced and overcame coming to America. We started from the beginning, the Spanish-American War. History includes thousands of Filipinos who migrated to America and worked in the fields and canneries. It tells us of the struggles of the working class, the social injustice, Justices they faced and everything in between. We're trying to tell that story, yeah, yeah. And, and not let history repeat itself. 
The hope of Erwin Mina, who is the board president of the museum, is for the newer generations to learn from the history and from those who struggled before them so they can have greater success in life and achieve higher goals. So they can, they can make these decisions to become, to get their masters, to get their doctorates, to become plumbers. Or, or whatever. Tougher times in the earlier days is perhaps best illustrated through Larry Itliong, an icon to Filipino migrants and what Cesar Chavez was to the Mexican laborers. We farm workers uh, should have an organization of our own. That's Larry Itliong here. Okay. And this is Dolores Huerta. Then you have Cesar Chavez. Larry came to the U.S. in 1929 at age 15 and immediately began harvesting crops and canning fish across many states. He later moved to Stockton and got involved in the Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee, which was attempting to form a union for farm laborers. He staged a over 1,500 Filipino strike, a walkout. And the way he did it is they... It was during picking season, and that's the most lucrative time, and they walked out. Larry asked Cesar Chavez and his National Farm Workers Association to join the strike. They merged under a new name, the United Farm Workers, with Larry as assistant director. He was able to, to, to organize and have where it was a unity and you had collective bargaining. So all of a sudden, you know, you had you had fun, you had the capability and power against a $5 billion industry. The Delano workers' strike lasted five years and resulted in one of the most important victories in American labor, ending with a contract. The country was ripe for social justice. And Larry's legacy continues. In 2021, Filipino-American artists gathered at Brava Theater in San Francisco to create a brand new musical about the life, struggles, and achievements of Larry Itliong. It has roots that go back to Pangasinan, Philippines. Wow. It has roots that go back to uh, Stockton, uh, Alaska. It has roots that go back in this Seattle and in Coachella and Delano. This spring, a park will be dedicated in Delano, the Larry Itliong Unity Park, costing $13.3 million, will include an aquatic center, amphitheater, and sports fields. In Stockton, covering local news that matters, Rowena Shaddix, Fox, 40 News. Rowena, thank you. Well, if you would like to visit the Filipino American National Historical Society Museum is open on Saturdays and Sundays from 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. The museum is located on East Weber Avenue between North Sutter and North San Joaquin Streets in downtown Stockton. Well, she is the go to barber for the stars from David Bowie to Hugh Grant, Brad Pitt and even Elvis. How a Korean groomer became one of the most in demand for the Hollywood elite. Her story coming up. Welcome back to Celebrating Asian Pacific Heritage. A Korean hairstylist known as the godmother of grooming is credited for creating some of the most iconic hair looks in the industry. Fox 40 contributor Ginger Chan has more. Listen, I'm really, really touched. Most people know the iconic, cool, classic look actor Hugh Grant dons in his movies, but that didn't come by accident. This is with Hugh Grant. It was the work of stylist to the stars, Mira Chai Hai, that revolutionized the actor's image. He went from that look to that look. And that was caught the day I cut his hair. The Hugh Grant cut, as it became known as, set the course for both Grant and Hyde's careers. So I changed his hair from his collegiate, long, floppy look to the choppy look. Totally changed his look. Yeah, oh yeah. I made him look cool. Hyde, whose mother was Korean and father Caucasian, decided on her own to move to America at the age of 14 after living in the Philippines. But her upbringing wasn't a traditional Asian-American one. I made a decision because I nearly died from drugs. I was 13 and I was um, coming off opium and barbiturates and I was living in hippie pads and I didn't really have a home. In the U.S., Hyde heard about the Vida Sassoon School in London where she attended and later graduated. And they said to me, we don't want hairdressers for women's hair, we need barbers. So if you want to join us, you have to be a barber. And that's how I became a barber.
This is my crowning moment in hair. After 18 years of traversing London and working with stylist Alexander McQueen, Hyde moved back to America where she had to start all over again. With the help of another Asian American icon, Hyde's career took on a new life. Jean Yang, who is the top male stylist here in Hollywood, and I worked together and she got me into her agency, which was a game changer for me, because then all of a sudden the publicist wanted to work with me. Settling in L.A., Hyde's space looks like a museum filled with pictures and paintings showing off her artistic flair. And with a long list of clients, once in a while, it's hard to remember offhand all the famous ones. Oh, Brad Pitt. What about David Bowie, who has such an iconic look? Oh God, I was a bit starstruck, but he was so nice and he was so kind. The only thing he said to me was, the only thing I don't like is when the parting goes all the way to the back. Can you just make sure that it's only to hear the party. And that was it. And he let me have free reign. Hollywood is becoming more diverse behind and in front of the camera. Asian American stars like Simu Liu and Steven Yun are in the spotlight. And Hyde is the go-to barber for the Hollywood elite. We're having a real moment right now. I really love it. And, and, and I just think these men are so talented and so gorgeous. They should be showcased. They trust me to make them look really good and they don't have to worry about it when they're on the carpet or whatever and that's that's also a very big part of why I love my job because I love making people feel really good about themselves it's a really it's a blessing our thanks to Fox 40 contributor Ginger Chan for that report and our AAPI Heritage Month coverage doesn't stop here we'll be bringing you more stories right through the end of the month to view all of our coverage including reports from our next our sister stations all across the country just head to fox40.com or download our Fox 40 app from everyone here at Fox 40 we want to thank you for watching I'm Sincere Tonsil have a good night